Okay, good afternoon, good evening, or even good morning if there are some early risers in the Americas, and welcome to the ISSF webinar on understanding corrosion. My name is Tim Collins and I'm the Secretary General of the International Stainless Steel Forum, and I'll be hosting the event over the next hour. Um, I'd just like to check before we start um, if we can select somebody who's online that audio clarity is good. We had a bit of an echo this morning. So uh, Joe, who's assisting me in this, might be able to su suggest somebody. Mr. Chung. Mr. Chung from ISSF and POSCO in Korea. Can you hear us okay? I think Joe's unmuted you. Um, have you got him hello uh, hello yeah i can hear you very clearly perfect mr chung thank you okay so we clarified that everything's uh, running as it should do right so before we launch into the uh, webinar itself just a couple of uh, important things <clears throat> firstly the presentation will be supplied to all attendees so there's no need to ask that as a question um, secondly the presentation is being recorded so it will be put up on youtube after the event so there's an ability not just to wade through it but to hear the, the commentary too and we would also like to ask that if people would like to pose questions please do that via the online chat facility, which is part of the webinar features. And then we can uh, select the questions towards the end of the session. Now we won't have time to answer all the questions live. However, we will respond to all questions that we can't take during the live webinar today. We will respond by email. And if anybody has any additional questions, they can, of course, email them after the webinar and they'll be answered too. So nobody's question will get overlooked. Um, but of course, I'm sure you'll understand that we just can't fit everything in in the one hour session. Um, so I'm going to kick off and I will speak for about 45 minutes, leaving about 15 minutes at the end for questions. And before I move to the sort of introductory slide, the uh, opening photograph of the car graveyard in Sweden uh, was chosen for two reasons. One, because it displays uh, how things corrode and decay over time, but I think equally in today's age it's somewhat symbolic that we're approaching the end of the internal combustion engine as we move into other modes of powering uh, vehicles and our mobility sector. So it was deliberately chosen to have a, a double impact today. So we just have to get in gear for moving forwards. Right. So the agenda today, we have a handful of topics. I'll first introduce the concept and the themes we'd like to talk about today. There will be one or two areas that are somewhat provocative, certainly in the early part of this presentation. We'll talk about or I'll talk about how we consider material decay and corrosion and also do we delay or prevent this feature from happening. Given that we represent the stainless steels industry, it's no surprise that we're going to talk about uh, corrosion types in stainless steels, and that will be the bulk of the presentation. But we'll also touch on a, a decay timeline so we can view materials alongside other materials in a particular environment. And then towards the end, we'll talk about how to prevent corrosion, the key considerations a summary section and then we have a whole bunch of appendices attached to the presentation which I won't be going through today but will provide additional and supporting information to help people be guided in how to make the right choices of material and what things to consider when thinking about corrosion. So that's the outline of what we're going to go through today. So I'll start with a, an introduction. <clears throat> So, I think it's fair to say that as a global society, we all recognize we have many materials at our disposal, and we know some of those are natural materials, wooden, stone being two that 
spring to mind very comfortably and we know there are many man-made options uh, steels concrete and polymers are around us all the time and we love some of them and we don't love some of them so much but we use them all and we recognize the benefits of all these things and over time there's been many many innovative uses of all these different materials whether it be in accommodation or infrastructure through to transport agriculture healthcare, food processing etc etc but most of these materials have one common feature over time they decay there are different speeds of decay there are different decay mechanisms and delaying or preventing material decay is truly big business it's not free of cost absolutely not and in many cases it's highly expensive and that's an interesting question to set uh, for today's webinar because material decay can be quite extreme as shown in this picture of a steel chain and material decay can cause major failures this is an example of a part of a bridge structure over seawater and it's constructed very traditionally with carbon steel rebar in concrete encasing that and the carbon steel rebar is corroded whilst within the concrete because that's a volume expansion rust is bigger than the um, volume of the original substrate metal the carbon cracks spoils and exposes more rebar and if people cast their eyes just to the central left hand edge of this photograph you'll actually see a piece of tie wire holding one of the or two of the pieces of rebar together which is quite a scary uh, feature in this that uh, somebody thought that was an acceptable thing to do um, but this is a great example of where things can go badly wrong because the appreciation of the corrosive environment was perhaps not fully understood so here we come to probably a small bit of controversy um, are we still thinking with yesterday's logic is our way of thought too much aligned towards the acceptance of established business and operational norms in other words we still focus on lowest cost bids to win contracts and maintenance is an issue for somebody else is this really short-term contract mentality blinding us from the real issues we ought to be facing and uh, a gentleman called Donald Sull, who was a professor at the London, London School of Economics, wrote an article in 1999 called Why Good Companies Go Bad. And within that article, he said that previous successes in organisations become blinders to accepting strong future approaches. And that's very much a behavioural consideration. So I'd like to sort of propose that that's something, including myself, we've all been guilty of at time, at times in the past. Uh, and we seem to be happy to accept that material decay will occur. And therefore, do we think that trying to delay that decay is genuinely the right approach and ultimately we replace things? So another piece of controversial statement, if we work in or thinking that manner, are we really continuing on the basis of reproducing and replacing materials, support for a fossil fuels based society. And we know what happens, we're seeing the evidence all around us now. Is that something we truly want to continue with? So let's just have a quick look at types of material decay over a, a small range of materials. And I'm not going to go through the detail of, of this slide, but you can see there are different types of decay decay onset varies from from day one or year one to, to much later in, in time and there are mitigating actions and what's interesting is that a lot of those mitigating actions involve some kind of treatment or coating uh, not always um, but in the case of some materials less mitigating actions are, are required and stainless steels are a case in point where with a carefully selected grade you can get a life of at least 100 years we can't offer more yet because the industry is only 107 years old um, but there are interesting options here and interesting ways of considering things <clears throat> 
So let's look at a few examples of material decay. We're all familiar with how wood and timber decays. Equally, we're all familiar with rusty things that gradually decay over time. Concrete, we see these examples. I mean, this is a balcony and you actually wonder how it's still there in this case. But we see examples of this all over the world constantly. Stone decays at a much slower rate, but you can see the beautiful concave wear patterns where people have traversed up and down the staircase, and that's common everywhere, but a much slower rate of decay. The copper roof structure there would have looked very attractive when it was first installed, but after many years and the green verdigris patina that develops, it looks, it looks less interesting, although it's probably still perfectly functional. And then plastics, we, we love our plastic lightweight garden furniture and other items but over time they will suffer sunlight decay and crack and break just as we see in this this example so there are lots of things we see in our day-to-day -day life of how how things do decay and it's almost we're at accepting of these features of life but of course choosing stainless and the Chrysler, Chrysler building is a great example uh, after 90 years it's only been cleaned three times with Household detergent um, still looks pretty good, I would say. And that's a great example of something that's not decaying and doesn't require much attention. So if we pose the question, why should we consider material decay? Um, well, I would argue that we should no longer separate the manufacturing and installation of things from the ongoing maintenance we should adopt cradle to grave thinking. That should be at the heart of what we do at each and every time. And that's very much backed up by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 9, which reads, we should build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. And the only way we can build in a resilient way if we, is if we think and design with longevity in mind. So that means we have to be more original and innovative in our thinking. It also means that we have to choose materials that offer longevity and appropriate complementary materials that go with them too. So it's a different way of approaching things. So if we summarize material decay, we know it affects many materials. We're familiar with that. We know that some materials speed up the rate of decay of other materials, so uncoated carbon steel rebar in concrete, for example. But we equally know that there are some materials that are high res highly resistant to decay. Aluminium and its alloys, titanium and its alloys, and stainless steels, these groups of materials are in a different ballpark. But what stops us selecting the highly decay resistant materials? Is it that we like to stick with what we know? We have a lack of knowledge of other materials. Do we just not consider no maintenance as an option? Is that not in our remit or our thinking? Do we focus on aesthetics more than anything? Are we frightened by cost or perceived cost of apparently more expensive materials? Do we suffer client pressure because they're in the same mindset and way of thinking? So lots of reasons why we perhaps don't think in a cradle to grave way so if we move forward and think about do we delay material decay or do, do we just find a way to prevent it we know we can slow down the rate of material decay we can create barrier layers through painting galvanizing epoxy coatings we can chemically impregnate things with chemical treatments for for timber but ultimately these approaches all fail and maintenance regimes and or material replacement become absolutely necessary now maintenance regimes as i said earlier are high cost and if you think from a life cycle perspective typically you're going to spend 50 to 60 percent of the life cycle costs on maintenance if you've not chosen a material that doesn't decay and again there's many reasons some of them uh, we've touched on before things look nice so we make them out of those materials we believe natural materials can be sustainably replaced and that's that's interesting which i'll come to in a moment um, there's a fashion for low low cost short life products because things change and we we like to change as fashions move and trends change but also there's the sort of counter side that 
in doing some of these things, we create ongoing demand, and that's not a bad thing in itself. But another question I'd like to pose is, do we really think about the carbon footprint of materials that decay? And timber's a great example of that, because we can replant trees, of course we can, and that feels great. There's nothing wrong with that. But we have to preserve the wood with paints and chemicals, and often the carbon footprint of those treatments is not good. And many of these treatments are poisons. So do we actually join everything up when we're thinking about choice of materials? Is there another consideration though? Barrier layers are very commonplace today, but a passive film is a very different consideration. And passive films form naturally on some, some materials, and we touched on those earlier, aluminium and its alloys, titanium and its alloys, and stainless steels. And really, it's fair to say that passive films have the following characteristics. They're generally transparent. They are an oxide of one of the alloying elements present in the material or alloy. They are self-repairing, an important feature if they're damaged. They are highly adherent to the substrate material. And then that's generally because the molecular size of, of the oxide is very close to the molecular size of the substrate material. So you get a lovely bond there. They're very thin, typically two to three nanometers thick. And they, as a result of that, offer enhanced corrosion resistance. And you can always further enhance these passive films as well, where you've got more aggressive environments. So in the case of stainless steels, molybdenum is a great element that can be added to give increased resistance against something known as pitting corrosion, which I'll talk about a little later. So let's have a simple look at passive films versus barrier layers. And the top diagram set shows the passive film arrangement. And if you look at the left hand of the three diagrams in the top half, there you have the substrate material at the bottom, the passive film sitting on top, and oxygen molecules hanging around as they do in the atmosphere. And if you take a trusty instrument, an axe or something similar, and inflict a nasty groove in the material, you've clearly destroyed the passive film momentarily. But the presence of oxygen means that that passive film will immediately repair itself. And even though you've got a groove in the material, you've at least re-established the passive film because the oxygen molecules combine with the key element in the case of stainless steels, it's chromium, to form that oxide on the surface that, as we said, was tightly adhering. Whereas with barrier layers, you generally have to apply several layers, a primer layer, a protective layer, and a top layer on top of that. And over time, they loosen, they get scratched, they don't self-repair. Um, so you have lots of problems. And, and whilst they're very much thicker, once you start to damage them, you're actually inviting corrosion and decay to occur. So yes, they're probably cheap and easy, but they require a lot of attention as well. So let's think about the passive film materials. We've touched on them already, and unsurprisingly, given that we're a stainless steels organization, we're gonna focus on stainless steels for the rest of the, the session. And in the family of stainless steels, you've got four family groups. The Martin City group, which display modest to good, corrosion resistance at the lower end of our spectrum. The ferritic group, which display reasonable to very good corrosion resistance. The austenitic group, which many people are familiar with, display good to excellent corrosion resistance. And you've generally got the 18.8, the 304, and then the molly bearing version of that 316, which have good corrosion resistance and moving into the super austenitics 904L and 654 SMO have excellent corrosion resistance. And then the most recent family of grades, although it is 90 years old, I think now, the duplex family, display good to excellent corrosion resistance. And in there, you've got the lean duplexes with low nickel uh, showing good corrosion resistance and the standard and super duplexes showing excellent corrosion resistance. And we'll come back and touch on those in a little while. Now, how do these families sort of look together? Well, you have the Martin Citic group, which are basically the carbon chromium or sometimes carbon chromium nickel steels, 
offering high strength, reasonable ductility, but modest, more modest corrosion resistance. Then you have the ferritic group, which uh, have reasonable ductility and corrosion resistance. These are resistant to a form of corrosion called stress corrosion, which leads to stress corrosion cracking. Um, and then you have the austenitic group, which is much more well known about with good strength. These are highly formable, good to excellent corrosion resistance, as I said. And these products don't suffer a transition from a ductile form to a brittle form, even at very low temperatures, which is another advantage of the austenitic group. And this is where people are familiar with the 18.8s and the 18.10s and all the associated products that are in this family. But sitting between ferritics and austenitics are the sort of new kid on the block, so to speak, even at 90, still the new kid on the block in many people's heads. And this is a combination of the ferritic body-centered cubic structure and the austenitic face-centered cubic structure. So you've got a blend of these two structures in there, which gives high strength, good to absolutely excellent corrosion resistance, but not losing so much on ductility, good fatigue strength. And here you have the sort of classic duplex grades, duplex grades with 2205 uh, being the most common. And then we've gone leaner in more recent times and also into the super duplexes, 2507. Um, so that's the sort of whole stainless family. And you can see that there's different ranges of corrosion resistance in there. But nothing comes for free. There's always a note of caution everywhere. And corrosion will occur even on stainless steels if the selection of the grade, the stainless steel grade, is not appropriate for the intended application. There is always a need to consider the operating environment, the steady state environment, so be the temperature, the load, corrosive products it's exposed to, the atmosphere, etc. But also how that's likely to change both in extreme circumstances, and we're aware of extreme environments now with the changes in weather particularly that we see, but also expected future changes. Because if we're thinking about a product that is going to last 100 years, you don't want to be disappointed. So we have to think about the future as well. So in order to do that, we must understand both corrosion and corrosion mechanisms to select the right grade. And I'd like to illustrate that with an example. So here we have a, a lovely stainless bench that's on a seafront close to a beach. And um, what's interesting about this is when the tide comes in, the tide comes right up to the tide wall, which the beach is sitting facing, and the seawater splashes over that wall onto the bench. And there are several of these benches along the promenade stretch. And when you start to look closely at the bench, you can see that there is staining below the adoption plaque. Each of these benches are adopted by a member of the local area or a tourist that has visited them. You also have corrosion at the ends of each of the stainless beams and corrosion on the support feet. And these things don't look so appealing now. I'm sure when they were first installed, they were great. But once you start to see signs of rust and corrosion, it looks a little more disappointing. But this is quite easy to explain why this particular stainless steel bench looks like it is probably two fundamental reasons. The wrong grade of stainless was selected for the environment. This is a seawater environment where you've got chlorides present. So you've got a higher chance of corrosion, but also the design has created a preferential set of corrosion sites at the beam ends. These are what's known as crevices, and I'll talk about crevice corrosion a little while. So this was a completely avoidable outcome through just a little bit of forward thinking. And I'll talk about that, as I've said, shortly. So let's move on now to the sort of main body of the presentation and talk about um, types of corrosion in stainless steels. So there's many types of corrosion. I am going to talk about six today, notably uniform or atmospheric corrosion, galvanic or bimetal corrosion, crevice corrosion, which I touched on a moment ago, Pitting corrosion, which is a very important consideration in marine environments and when chlorides are present. Intergranular corrosion, 
And finally, stress corrosion that leads to stress corrosion cracking. So we'll start by talking about uniform corrosion. And this is simply defined as corrosion, corrosion that is evenly distributed across the material surface being attacked. So the whole exposed surface corrodes pretty much uniformly. And this is very typical of how unprotected carbon steels corrode. And this will be caused by sort of rain, humidity, urban pollution. All these features and mechanisms promote corrosion of what we would term a passive materials. So materials without a passive film. But for materials with a passive film, you can also get uniform corrosion in an aggressive environments, which effectively destroy that passive film. So aggressive environments usually mean some kind of acidic type attack in the case of stainless steels. And these will attack materials in a very uniform way once you've destroyed the passive film. That's not to say, though, that the passive film can't resist these forms of attack. But we have to recognize what is likely to occur to be able to resist it. So whilst we're talking uniform corrosion, I'd just like to demonstrate the importance of chromium as an alloy in materials. And on this graph, we have a corrosion rate on the y-axis on the left expressed in millimeters per year, and then chromium content on the x-axis varying from zero right up to 20%. And we could go on if we wanted above that, but there's no real need. And really you can classify in the steel family three groups of materials carbon steels right on the left hand edge the the non-stainless low alloy steels in the sort of midsection and then to the right of the vertical dotted line stainless steels and that's where you've got 10.5 percent chromium or more and it's very easy to see the relationship as you add chromium and once you get above 10 and a half percent chromium the corrosion rate drops dramatically and it's close to zero when you're sort of in the higher end of the chromium range on this particular chart. So I think that's a very clear demonstration of how important chromium is. And it's chromium, in this case, that forms the passive film. And particularly above 10.5% chromium, the passive film is readily formed and, as I've said, is self repairing. So, how do we prevent? uniform corrosion well you can do it with barrier layers of course i mean galvanizing steel products has been around for many many years and is quite an effective approach and we'll touch on that a little later in a bit more detail when we get to galvanic corrosion as well you can attach a sacrificial anode to the material that will decay and corrode preferentially and again we'll touch on that in the section on bimetallic or galvanic corrosion you can apply painting and coating. We've talked about that as well, but you have to recognize there's a maintenance element that comes with that. Or you can choose a different material, something with a passive film, a much simpler approach because it prevents corrosion. It's a compelling concept, but it's not always the first choice. And from a life cycle costing perspective, passive film materials will generally be a much better choice. Now I'd like to move on to the second of our corrosion mechanisms, pitting corrosion. This is described as a localized form of corrosion. It leads to the creation of small holes in the alloy as depicted in the photograph on the right. And chloride ions are really well known to cause this type of corrosion because fundamentally they destabilize the passive film. But you can overcome that, the addition of molybdenum restabilizes the passive film and prevents that pitting corrosion but it's good to recognize that the amount of molybdenum needed is relative is related to the chloride content of the operating environment so it's not not just as simple as saying add two percent molybdenum and you're sorted you have to think a little more about the operating environment it's also useful to highlight the influencing factors and there's three core in influencing factors here and one sort of urban myth that I'd like to dispel at the, at the bottom of this table. So the temperature of the operating environment has an impact on pitting corrosion. As temperature increases, the likelihood of pitting corrosion increases. And 
increasing the proportion of molybdenum protects against that because it retains that stability in the passive film. And molybdenum is pretty much the sort of uh, key remedy here because I talked briefly about chloride concentration in the environment. Here the relationship is that pitting corrosion resistance decreases as the log of the chloride ion concentration increases. And again, addition of molybdenum will prevent that problem from occurring. And then on top of that, we know that the chemical analysis overall with three key elements playing an important role. Nitrogen has a strongly positive impact uh, of improving corrosion resistance in this sort of environment. But the downside is you, you get a worse impact on hot workability. So it's a less easy product to produce. But you don't tend to need nitrogen in huge quantities anyway. Uh, molybdenum has a fairly strong impact, doesn't really affect hot workability. And chromium has a positive impact, but not as powerful as molybdenum. And again, doesn't adversely affect hot workability. But these three elements together come in an empirical relationship to present what's known as the pitting resistance equivalent number, PREN, which is a very powerful guide to helping choose the appropriate grade of stainless steels when you need to consider this type of corrosion. Now, it's lastly, before I move on to the next slide and talk about pitting resistance, um, the nickel content doesn't have an impact in this area. <clears throat> I've heard a few people over the years believe it does. So just to dispel any myths, nickel is not an influencing factor here. So now I'd like to look momentarily at the pitting resistance equivalent number. And we have here a range of primarily stainless grades, but right at the bottom left, carbon steel. And each of these products is shown uh, it, where its position is on the pitting resistance equivalent number scale, which is the left-hand y-axis. There's a horizontal line on there, which is the threshold for corrosion resistance in seawater environments. So you can see in this, there are some stainless steels that are not so effective if operating in a seawater environment, and carbon steel certainly isn't. And you can see there the expression for how this um, pitting resistance equivalent number is built up. So this is a useful guide, and in uh, one of the appendices documents, there is further guidance on how to, how to use this to good effect. But this just illustrates the range of pitting resistance equivalent numbers we have across the bulk of the stainless family. So how do we prevent pitting corrosion? So first and foremost, we need to understand the environment because without that, we don't have a clue what to do. So we need to think about corrosive media, contact mechanisms, and the operating conditions, particularly the temperature range, min, max, and, and average. We need to know what's going on there. We can then start to determine the appropriate pitting resistance equivalent number that is required. So these elements are connected, understanding the environment, determine the pitting resistance equivalent number. As I've said, guidance to this is found in the appendices, but also we have to recognize that the operating environment may well change. It's important that we deal with that. And we've got to think over the lifetime. And that's not always easy, but we have to take some good judgments into account there. So I'd now like to move on to crevice corrosion, which is quite easy to define, but is often a surprise for people because crevices in this domain are not always perceived as crevices. So I'll start with the definition. A crevice is a confined space, examples of which are gaps in and contact areas between material parts, spaces under gaskets and seals, the space or spaces inside cracks and seams, a space filled with deposits or spaces under sludge piles. And the photograph on the right shows a crevice, which is actually the space between a, a washer and the material that it is fixing to something else. And perhaps you wouldn't normally consider that as a crevice, but it really is in this case. And you can see the corrosion occurring that sort of leached out from the crevice area. 
And when you put things together, create a, an installation, at the start, there's no difference between the crevice and the whole surface in terms of how it resists corrosion. But then fairly quickly after that, the crevice space becomes depleted in oxygen. And that allows an electrochemical reaction to occur in that crevice. And chloride ion concentration generally builds and that breaks down the passive layer. So then the metal faces within that crevice undergo uniform corrosion. So this is uniform corrosion caused by a series of other features in perhaps an area that we don't recognize naturally as a crevice. And that's the same as filled, when you're filled with deposits or under sludge piles. You can create these same conditions. So how do we prevent this? So first and foremost, we have to think about product and component design. So design things to minimize joints with fixings as far as possible. Don't create crevices. That means using welded parts to eliminate crevices caused by traditional fixings. Or design, or this is a combination, and or design products and components for complete drainage. So you can't have the buildup of sludges and deposits. Regularly clean things to remove those deposits. If you can't design them out, ensure that regimes are in place to clean them. Select the appropriate stainless steel that will resist the types of corrosion you're going to get. So that means appropriate for the operating environment. And then use all stainless materials to prevent other corrosion types. So if we now jump onto galvanic or bimetallic corrosion, this is corrosion that is described as corrosion that occurs when two metals or alloys with very different galvanic potentials are in contact and are connected by a conducting liquid, an electrolyte. And that can include humidity. And in this case, what happens is the most anodic or least noble of the metals or alloys is attacked. An electrical current flows from the anodic metal to the cathodic metal via the liquid, the electrolyte, and that causes the anodic metal to dissolve. And the photograph here is a great example of where a second nut has been used to provide security on a fitting, fairly common practice, but being of a dissimilar material, galvanic corrosion has occurred. So this is a very simple but classic example of something being undertaken with good intent, but having a bad outcome. So if we quickly look at the galvanic series of metals and alloys, and this is not an exhaustive list, but this is designed just to show off um, some key products, key metals and materials for reference. And on the left-hand side, you have the most noble materials, the things that will resist corrosion when coupled to something on the right. So the things on the right will corrode or decay preferentially. So on the right, you have magnesium, zinc, aluminium alloys, carbon steels. It's things that we've probably seen decaying in, in some way. And on the left, you have uh, interestingly gold that we're probably not going to use too much, uh, but it is a very noble material. And then you move into sort of nickel alloys, titanium, duplex stainless steels, austenitic stainless steels, etc. So you can see if you put things from the extreme in contact, the ones on the right hand side are going to corrode preferentially and sometimes very quickly. So in terms of galvanic corrosion, what do we do? So first and foremost, try and avoid situations with dissimilar metals in contact with each other. And the, the two nuts is a classic case in point that was perfectly preventable. But if dissimilar metals are in contact, ensure that Firstly, the anode has a much larger surface area than the cathode, because if you're going to sacrifice a product, you want it to have a large surface area. So that's really important. When using dissimilar metals, however, you've also got to think about fasteners. And then some key rules. Use stainless steel fasteners for aluminium products, but never the other way around, never aluminium fasteners for stainless products. Use stainless steel fasteners for carbon steel products, but never the other way round. And a classic example of that for people that like to go to football matches, particularly gents, because uh, 
you don't have this feature for, for ladies at football matches. In the modern football grounds, even though we can't attend at the minute, have stainless steel urinals. And in many cases, they're fitted, fixed to the wall with carbon steel fittings. And of course, the carbon steel fittings are rusting and eventually they'll drop off the wall, which can be a particularly uh, exciting moment at a football game. Anyway, just a simple indication of how things can go wrong with unintended consequences. But as a point of note here, galvanized carbon steel, whilst it will resist corrosion rather well, will suffer corrosion if the galvanized layer is damaged or does not cover 100% of the carbon steel. Once the zinc has corroded away, you'll start to get other corrosion mechanisms occurring on top of that. So it is a note of caution. And then the worry is here that zinc ultimately ends up back in aquifers and it's a toxicity problem. Zinc is not an inert metal in its own right. So just a note of caution to be aware of. Now I'd like to move on to intergranular corrosion. Uh, and this type of corrosion is caused by the formation of chromium carbides within structures, particularly at grain boundaries, which reduces the overall chromium content of the alloy. And that, in effect, reduces the stability of the passive film. And you can see from the molecular analysis there that six carbon atoms mop up 23 chromium atoms here. So the impact is almost four to one. And that means that the grain boundary zone where this chromium has been sucked out from becomes anodic relative to the rest of each grain in the structure. And then the corrosion can occur along a narrow path along these grain boundaries. And this type of corrosion occurs particularly in situations of welding. So in the heat affected zone around a weld, if the carbon content of the stainless steel is high, and all the steel is not stabilized with titanium or niobium, which will preferentially bond with the carbon at these elevated temperatures, then you will get intergranular corrosion uh, close to the heat affected zone. But also, if you're undertaking multipass welding, by reheating a welded component multiple times and even if you've got titanium or niobium in there to mop up the carbon, those carbides cannot diffuse away from the weld bead and you get a phenomenon known as knife line attack. However, at the end of the welding process, if you reheat the welded area, this will allow diffusion to occur and prevent this type of intergranular corrosion. So these things can be overcome. These are a few photographs of how this phenomenon looks. The Top left happens to be a micrograph showing the depletion of chromium along the grain boundaries and the attack that occurs there. And then you can see some real life examples with some sort of frightening pictures of how things can decay and fail. So how, what do we do to prevent this? Well, first and foremost, foremost use low carbon, that's less than 0.03% austenitic stainless steel. So there isn't the carbon around to mop up the chromium when you're undertaking welding and things like that. If you can't achieve that, or that's the wrong type of grade, then use stabilizing elements for both austenitic and peritic stainless steels. And this is titanium or niobium being the most common because they will preferentially combine with carbon at these elevated temperatures. And remember that if you're undertaking multipass welding, they should be heat treated at the end. This will allow diffusion of those carbides to occur. So three very simple thoughts there to prevent intergranular corrosion. So finally, in this section, I'd like to move on to stress corrosion, which is a interesting and yet frightening aspect of corrosion. And it generally arises as a result of the following thing. The product or component is stressed by an applied load or a residual stress. And we're talking tensile stresses only here, not compressive stresses. The operating environment is aggressive, and that can be high concentrations of chloride, hydroxide ions, hydrogen sulfide. And the operating temperature in that, in that, that environment is greater than 50 degrees centigrade. And the third dimension is the selected stainless steel grade does not have sufficient stress corrosion resistance. 
And the result of stress corrosion is quite shocking. It's the sudden cracking of fa and failure of a product or component without any deformation. So that's what people refer to as stress corrosion cracking. And here's the mechanism. This is how it works. So you have this combined action of environmental conditions and stress. So the con conditions that are, as I said, with a sort of aggressive environment things and elevated temperatures, stress can be applied, residual or some combination of that. And what happens then within the material is that initially the mechanism is pitting corrosion. And then cracks start to form from those pit initiation sites and the cracks propagate through the metal or the alloy and that can be in a transgranular across the grains or intergranular longer grain boundary approach and then suddenly the product or component fails so as i said this is quite a scary feature but can be prevented with the right choice of material and this diagram shows the stress cracking stress corrosion cracking thresholds for different stainless grades so on the x-axis here we have operating temperature on the sorry on the y-axis on the left we have operating temperature on the bottom on the x-axis we have chloride concentration and if you take any one of the lines so the red line which represents 304 and 316 austenitic stainless mm -hmm. if your operating temperature is low below 50 degrees centigrade you're not going to suffer stress corrosion cracking but once you start to go above that threshold then increasingly high chloride concentrations will move you into a dangerous ground so if you had an operating temperature of 100 degrees centigrade and a chloride concentration of 0.1 percent a 304 or 316 austenitic stainless would be at risk of stress corrosion cracking. You have to move up that chart to select an appropriate duplex stainless steel in this case. But there's also things like the super austenitic stainless steels. So 904L super austenitic can tolerate a reasonable amount of chloride concentration and quite high temperatures. And when you move to the real super duplex grades, the 2507, this is really not susceptible to stress corrosion cracking within the sort of boundaries of, of, of this diagram. So this is really an indication of you have to think about the environment and the temperature to choose the right stainless to avoid this phenomenon. So the preventive actions. Peritic and duplex stainless steels are pretty much immune to stress corrosion cracking, noting that there are some environment concentration and some temperature effects as you move to the sort of leaner duplex steels and this is because the ferritic atomic structure the body centered cubic structure is not sensitive to this stress corrosion phenomenon so you're left with two basic choices select duplex stainless steels um, recognizing that there's a different degree of susceptibility even though they are much less susceptible than, than other products or select high nickel, high molybdenum and austenitic stainlesses like the 904L or 654 SMO types, highly alloyed austenitic grades. <clears throat> but there is again a note of caution here. Even though ferritic stainless steels are pretty much immune to stress corrosion cracking, because they are weaker as a choice in other corrosion mechanisms where, where those other mechanisms are present, they are not necessarily the most favored choice so you have to think about what other corrosion mechanisms are likely to be present so now we've come to the end of that i'd like to sort of just briefly talk about the decay timeline and there are just a handful of different materials here and if you talk about polymers you're probably talking somewhere in the range of 11 to 20 years before they decay and they often these things are often used outside, so they suffer from decay due to sunlight exposure and crack and break quite quickly, even though they're very useful, flexible light. When you move to reinforced concrete, then we've touched on how this occurs, but basic, the, basically the mechanism in an urban environment, you get carbonation of the concrete that reduces the pH, 
of the concrete that causes the rebar to decay. It's a volume expansion because rust is bigger than the substrate material. That causes to, the concrete to spall and crack. That exposes the rebar and the corrosion continues. So reinforced concrete, if it's not um, made with either a properly coated rebar steel product or stainless steel, will suffer this process. And you've probably got somewhere between 40 and 50 years of life here. Carbon steels start to corrode pretty quickly from, from day one. They rust fairly uniformly and they will fail over a similar to, sort of time scale. With untreated aluminium, bear in mind there are different treatments for these materials, um, then uh, you will start to see these corroding progressively over time, but you've got a better life in excess of 60 years, typically. And then stainless steels at the bottom of this will give you at least 100 years of good life and look pretty pristine, but recognize there is still the need to prevent things like pitting corrosion by regular cleaning and good design of these products. So the decaying timeline is just there to illustrate the possibilities and for some products you know shorter lives are okay we're not saying that's bad but if you're thinking long term and you're thinking don't want to replace things or have the disruptions that come with that then you need to be looking at materials towards the bottom end of this spectrum so if we move forward now to key considerations when we're preventing corrosion and i would outline sort of nine considerations Know your required lifetime, understand the operating environment, understand the likely corrosion mechanisms. Think about your product or component design to eliminate or sort of reduce the risk of these corrosion mechanisms. Equally, think about fabrication techniques that will do the same. Do you require fixings or can you overcome the need for fixings? But also then you've got your material or materials selection. What materials are right for the environment? Then you select the appropriate grades of materials. And even within that, because you might have specific corrosion mechanisms, you need to choose key element levels, particularly when you're dealing with metals and alloys. And that can be neatly summed up in a preventing corrosion flowchart. So you have the first three characteristics of lifetime operating environment and corrosion mechanisms come together and you split into two component parts. One about the product, how you make it and how you fix it. and One about the materials, how to avoid the corrosion, the appropriate grades, the key element levels to reduce the risk of specific corrosion types. And there is a worked uh, example of this in the appendices for people to refer to later. So I'd now like to sort of sum up what I've gone through over the last 45 minutes. So we should design for a maintenance-free operating life. It's the lowest cost and most environmentally friendly solution, but it does require end-to-end -end thinking, life cycle considerations. We need to understand how corrosion is likely to occur to avoid future disappointment and what type of corrosion is likely to occur, because that will inform us about the product or component structure and design, the fabrication approaches, and will assist with appropriate material selection. But it does require thinking both here and now and well into the future. And we should apply a, a structured approach to preventing corrosion, both at the design stage to bring all the relevant features together, and then through the lifetime of the product as well. because even low maintenance options require some maintenance. So I'd like to end the webinar at this point and thank everybody for their attention. And if anybody has any questions, I don't know if we've got much that's come in yet, Joe. Yes, we have had some questions, Tim. Um, so the first question is um, regarding stainless steel families. Are precipitation hardening stainless steels considered a family? That's an interesting question because there are different schools of thought here mm -hmm. and some people absolutely argue that they are a family on their own and they have a specific set of highly prized attributes. Um, but there are equally the people that will say 
hey, ultimately they're part of the Martin City group. So I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. I chose four families purely for space reasons on the slide and nothing more sophisticated than that. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a next question. So it's, uh, generally speaking, can we say that lean duplex 2101 is better than standard austenitics 316 in terms of corrosion resistance? The question is, it depends on the types of corrosion that are likely to occur. And if I sort of quickly go back to the, um, whilst we're sort of thinking about this question, to the uh, section on... Slide 15, I think it is. Thank you, I'll be there in a moment. This one. <clears throat> So you can see here that 316L, uh, just above the seawater threshold line, and then just to the right of that, two dots to the right, you have 2101 duplex. Their pitting, pitting resistance equivalent numbers are very similar. So really, there's not a huge amount to choose between them from a pitting resistance perspective, but it depends what else is going on as well you know fundamentally what are you looking for if you're looking for higher strength then the duplex grade will offer that but if you want something that's more formable the 316 will offer that so there's always a trade-off so from a corrosion resistance perspective they're quite similar but you have to think about what else you need with that okay and a little bit following up on that um is given the current state of, of, of stainless steel prices, um, could you compare between initial costs of standard or synthetics 316 and the lean duplex 2101? Yes, generally with the lean duplex, it will be a cheaper product, but it's not cheaper based on the alloying elements specifically because if you just thought about that alone you would expect a much lower price when you move into duplex grades there's always a trade-off as i said and you get baggage of processing duplex grades are more difficult to process so that in itself attracts higher conversion costs and that's just a feature so fundamentally they are cheaper uh, and they're less volatile because you've you've taken the nickel down particularly to to low levels but you're increasing the demands on the production assets so that cost has to be recovered okay next question um at uh, a temperature of minus 20 degrees um can we leave uh, the steel structures uncoated yes <laughs> yes you can is the simple answer it really um you know as long as you're choosing the right grade I mean, an austenitic grade will not suffer uh, any transition into a brittle material. And the duplex grades are generally okay down to about minus 40, minus 50 centigrade. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, also a very interesting question, which is the most critical way of corrosion? If we have a combination of corrosion types, which should we try to avoid? All of them, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um it, it is a really good question because sometimes you are forced to compromise and as a, a with my ideal head on i would say don't don't compromise um there's no doubt that stress corrosion cracking is the scariest in my head because you don't often see that it's happening and then the thing fails uh, so that can lead to disasters but equally, if you're working with stainless steel's hidden in structures, where you, again, you've got a hidden potential issue, you need to avoid corrosion types in those hidden structures. So if you chose a 304 stainless steel, but you were in a seawater environment, you could get a really big disappointment and a lot of upset people and a lot of disastrous outcomes. So, I think to, to pick one alone would be wrong. You try and attack them all. Um, and I think the thing to remember is that even for a little extra cost up front for a very solid corrosion resistance stainless steel product, 
the benefits will come over the lifetime. You will take away those maintenance costs, which are frightening. And at the minute, in the life cycle costing analysis, we've not even considered the benefits of avoiding disruption to local economies when you remove the maintenance costs. So that the reduction of emissions, the decarbonisation that comes with avoiding things is not yet considered properly by anybody. And that's worth a huge amount. Okay. Um, next question is for improving resistance to intergranular corrosion. Um, heat treatment was mentioned for multi-pass welding. This is difficult for duplex grades due to microstructural limitations. Is there an exception for duplexes? Good question. And that's one of those I know, I don't know the full answer for off the top, but I will look this one up and come back to somebody. Because the issue when you're heat treating duplex grades is you need to rapidly cool after the solution treatment to avoid the formation of sigma phase in the structure. Um, and that's going to be one of the considerations and that can be overcome. Of course it can. Um, but I will refer to my font of all knowledge, one of my study books on this, so okay. I give a good answer. So if that's okay as a holding answer for now, I don't want to mislead anybody. Okay, so we will come back to that question. But, um, yeah. by Duplex email. welding, yeah. yeah, we'll come back to that. Um, uh, are you willing to take one more question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, next question. If uh, stress corrosion cracking starts with pitting corrosion, would it be right to say that stainless steel alloys that are good for pitting corrosion are also good for stress stress cracking corrosion? Okay. So, this is a fantastic question. So if we look at the mechanism. So here, we know that pitting corrosion initially starts with um, stress corrosion leading to cracking. Um, and often you've got associated with this chlorides, not exclusively. So higher molybdenum grades um, will certainly give you some significant benefits here. But if we go to the threshold diagram, which I've just put back on screen, what you will see here is 316 as an austenitic grade, as shown by the red line on this chart. Um, whilst it has some resistance to stress corrosion cracking, it's fairly limited because you would only, even in an environment with 0.01% chlorides, you couldn't operate above about 65 degrees centigrade. So you have to be mindful of a 316 is resistant against pitting corrosion, but if you want to use it at a higher temperature, it may not be the optimal choice. And so looking at this chart, 2304 duplex, which also contains molybdenum and is good against pitting corrosion, has better stress corrosion resistance. So there is some truth in what is being said, but it's not absolute that just choosing a grade that is known to be resistance against pitting corrosion will give you the resistance against, against stress corrosion in the environment you're working in. So you have to piece the two elements together. Okay. Um, I think uh, that was uh, the last question for today. Okay. Um, so we can close the session, I think. We can. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you for your attention. I hope some of it was at least useful. As I said, we'll respond to all questions, including the tricky one on, uh, on intergranular corrosion. And that's a really nice question, I must say. But I'll do it. I'll, I'll answer this one properly for you. Okay. Thank you, okay. too. Thank you.